Okay, I want to start with a, uh, a Gemara that the Rambam doesn't bring, but it's a very interesting Gemara. I try to speak out how to understand it, and then I, we'll get to loving Kodesh Baruch Hashneitz, the Chol of Avcha, the Shneitz Arecha. Gemara says that a person could do tshuva out of two motivations, and the result of doing tshuva out of each motivation is to affect the past action in a particular systematic way. So the two motivations are either yira, which should be taken to mean both fear and awe. There are single uses of yira which mean fear, and some, some single uses which mean awe, and sometimes it means a combination. One can do tshuva out of yira for God, in which case deliberate transgressions what's called Hebrew avon, become as if they were accidental, what's called shogeg. Now, a shogeg is something you're still responsible for. Shogeg means you didn't know it was wrong, but you should have known. You had a responsibility to know, and you had the capability of knowing, so your failure was in negligence in uncovering the information. That's not the same as doing it on purpose, but it's not free of guilt either. And in fact, there are systematic penalties for doing things with shogeg. And needs for kapara, needs for cleansing, and you certainly have to do tshuva if you did something with shogeg. But the severity of the crime is greatly reduced from deliberate to accidental. Ignorance, so to speak. That's to do tshuva out of yira. To do tshuva out of ava, out of love of God, then the past crime the past of Vera becomes like a mitzvah, becomes a source of merit. Now, <coughs> there are two separate questions here, one of which I'm not going to address. One is, how can anything I do now affect the character of the past? That's a whole subject unto itself, and I'm not going to talk about it tonight. I just suppose that that got that on board. What you're doing now is going to change how we look at the past. But I want to explain what's the systematic relationship between when you do tshuva out of yira, the intentional becomes as if it were just negligence and accidental. And if you do tshuva out of ava, out of love, then surprisingly, I would think, the past transgression becomes as if it's a mitzvah. What is the nature of that connection? And I suggest that the nature of the connection is to... Take your present state, where you are now, and graft it onto the past action. Past action was done when you were in a different state. You did it knowingly and deliberately violating the law. You knew you were doing that. Now you wouldn't do this. So now just take your present state and graft it onto the past and see what happens to the action in terms of your present state and then reinterpret the action. I have to see that in each case, the reinterpretation will give the outcome that the statement of Chazal said it would give. So let's take a person who does tshuva out of yira. What's his state of mind? Cheeseburgers are, are great. There's no question about it. <laughs> They're wonderful. But the creator said, no, the creator. So I still want them. I like them. <coughs> but how can I go against the Creator? I can't, I can't do that. So the person becomes now subject to a certain inner conflict where his desire for the, transgre the transgression is there, but there's now a big wall of appreciation, of motivation, which is in conflict with the desire for the cheeseburger, and he makes the right decision. I don't want to say that one's bigger than the other and it wins the struggle. That would presume there's no free will. But now, with that new uh, mental set, he, wins, he, he, he makes the right decision and doesn't eat the cheeseburger. So he's in a condition now where he wouldn't do the transgression. He wouldn't do it. The awe would stop him from doing it. And his action would be an appropriate action. So if in his present mental condition he happened to eat a cheeseburger, it couldn't be deliberately. Because where he is now, he couldn't do it deliberately. So the only way it could possibly happen is through negligence. 
Did I check the kashrus on the box? It always has the same kashrus, except for this time. It's a different box. It was a tragedy in Baltimore many years ago. They scheduled a cruise with a fancy dinner for donors and so forth and so on. And the secretary called up the kosher restaurant and ordered the food. In the middle of the meal, somebody, somebody became a little suspicious. Like he looked at the food, it didn't look right. He went into the kitchen and it was completely trafe. Turned out that this restaurant has two outlets with the same name. One's kosher and one's trafe. And the secretary looked it up in the phone book. She called one. She called the wrong one. Right? That's how things can go wrong. <clears throat> you know, the person lighting on the boat has the right to think that this is a reliable organization and that they can be trusted and the secretary is a reliable person. She just made a mistake. And that's the way in which the person in this new state of mind could do that action. He couldn't do it deliberately, but it could happen through that kind of negligence. So by grafting the present state of the person on the past act, you get the outcome of the, of the Gemara that if he does tshuva out of ira, then the past act becomes as if it were unintentional. <coughs> now for the second half, if he does tshuva out of ava, out of love, then the past act becomes, as the past transgression becomes as if it's a mitzvah. That's not easy to see. So I want to give you a, compa a comparison, a parable, which, which I hope will explain this. Let's imagine a Jewish boy, Robert Schwartz, who grows up on the wrong side of the tracks in Chicago, and he joins the youth gang, and he fights his way to the top, being Jewish, of course, and becomes the leader of the gang, and he's famous in some circles and infamous in other circles, and he leads them on their exploits, and he gets in trouble with the law, and these things happen. He gets to be 18, and he finishes high school, whether he graduates or not, and he's thinking about his life, what to do, he decides to go into the army. Goes into the army, and there he learns discipline, he learns uh, continuity, he learns consistency, and he learns what it means to study something and learn a new skill, and that skill is saleable. He, his life turns around. He finishes the tour of army duty, and he thinks, well, what will I do now? And he thinks, I'm going to go into police work. I'm going to become a policeman. And then I'm going to volunteer to work with youth gangs, because I know them well. I know what they do. I know how they do it. I know what they want. I know the social dynamics in the group. It'll be perfect for me, given the past that I have. It'll be perfect for me. And so he does. He goes to the police academy, he gets a degree, he explains to the people in charge what his background is, and they assign him to police work. Now let's contrast that outcome with when he becomes, uh, when he finishes the army, he says, I think I'm going to become a librarian. Librarian. Work with books, you know, serve the public, and learn another thing. And he does. There's a big difference between the two outcomes because if he becomes a librarian, his past, his illicit past now is just empty. It's cut off. It's not contributing to what he's doing and how he's doing it at all. Which is fine. I'm not saying that people like that have become librarians or failures. But if he becomes a policeman working with youth gangs, he's using the crimes that he committed in order to be able to do good for the world now. The very crimes he committed become the basis for the benefit he can give to the world. So he's, he's um, sublimated. He's using psychological terminology. Well, that's unconscious. I know it's usually involuntary. Okay, fine. We know that. Um, there, you could say, well, in his case, his illicit behavior now is producing good results. It's the, his key to making his contribution to society. So in that sense, what was before a deliberate crime now becomes the means by which good is produced. So <clears throat> I'm not claiming that that exhausts the metaphysics of the Gemara, that it becomes a merit, becomes a merit, but you can see how it's linked. The idea is linked, that when, when he does this, that's, that's, that's the outcome. Now let's go back to what we were talking about. 
doing, doing tshuva out of love. Now, um, there's a, a feature of love that I think is, is, is at work here. Let's imagine that you, you love someone, your relationship with that person, but there's a part of you that you're afraid to share. There's a part of you which you're afraid the other person won't appreciate or might jeopardize the relationship, so you keep that part of you secret. Are you fully satisfied with the relationship? Are you fully happy about the relationship? I don't think you are because love wants to share. Love wants to have a bonding that encompasses the whole person. And there's part of you that has to be kept secret. The love is frustrated. It's not zero. It's not worth throwing away, but it's frustrated in that part. Ideals where you can actually trust the person, build up, and this may take time, build up communication, build up trust, when we can share that part with the other person and trust the other person will understand and will identify with you and will see it for, in a way that will be best for both of you. <coughs> that's, much, that's a much better resolution from the point of view of the love that you have with that other person. I want to suggest the same is true if you, if you love a Kodesh Baruch Hu. If you love a Kodesh Baruch Hu, it is good and appropriate that you should do what he wants you to do. And if you have negative motivation, then it's good and appropriate you should conquer that motivation and do what he wants you to do. And you'll be rewarded for that, no question about it. But if you're doing tshuva out of love, it means that that negative motivation is not part of the love relationship. It's an enemy. It's a detractor. And you're fighting it down all the time. You're pushing it down all the time. As you should. And you'll be rewarded for so doing. But still, there's part of you that's rebelling against what the relationship requires in, in, in a particular case. So I think that scenario of the fellow who, you know, Robert Schwartz, who led the youth gang, and now wants to turn a di to a different direction for his life, he's going to feel much more whole in himself if he becomes a police officer because he now has continuity with his earlier self. So earlier self is not just simply forgotten. He's building on his earlier self. He now has an integrated life. And where he is as an adult, all of his life is contributing to the good that he's doing as an adult. That's much superior than, uh, to simply you know, putting a lid on it and, and forgetting it and going off and doing something else. And in a love relationship, that certainly is the better, uh, the better um, outcome, where you find a way to use that part of yourself which formerly led you to do things that were wrong. Maintain the motivations. Maintain the desires. Maintain the orientations, even sometimes the behaviors. But use them in a positive way. That, I think, is a model for to love Hashem with all your heart. And as those who are familiar with Hebrew know, the word for heart in Hebrew is lev, and your heart should be libcha, with one base. And there is such a word in Tanakh. It is spelled that way. And here it's the lavcha with a, with a second base, and that's why chazal darshan, you should love Hashem with both of your inclinations, your good inclination, evil inclination. To love Hashem with evil inclination means to co-opt the evil inclination into your service of a Kodesh Just like Robert Schwartz co-opted his criminal past into his positive contribution to society as an adult. So this becomes the idea of loving God with both your heart. Now you have a question. Um, I just wanted to ask and clarify with regards to the Teshuvah out of fear, the the teshuva out of love makes the parties become mitzvot, and what happened with the teshuva out of fear? What did the parties become? Just they became shogek. They became uh, something where it, it's like a like a. No, no, no. Shogek means that you did the wrong thing, but you didn't know it was the wrong thing, mm. but you should have known. Yeah. You had a responsibility to know, yeah. and you failed that responsibility. Yeah. But there was no uh, conscious, deliberate breaking of the law in the action because you didn't know you were breaking the law. Yes. 
That's called Shogeg. Thank you. Shogeg is negligent ignorance. Okay, so then, taking this on board, it, 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 it's a mark of Jewish spiritual creativity to find ways to take things which, in the, in the, in the way they're given, the way they're initially experienced, are negative, and to find ways to make them positive. <coughs> Hasidus does this to a great extent. Sambha Musa does this. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, I would say, I don't know, unique, I don't know, world, world cultures, but it's a characteristic of Jewish spirituality. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, Baal Shem Tov was once asked, uh, he's, the fellow said, I'm a lumber merchant, and when I'm praying, when I'm saying, when that's right, the thoughts of lumber and the price and floating it down the river and the markets. I, I get lost in that and I, I know you're not supposed to have foreign thoughts during, during uh, davening. And I, I'm asking you for help. How, what should I do about it? Now, you do find in the literature the idea that if you have foreign thoughts during davening, stop davening and push them out. Push them out. And then continue. Of course, let's say the following thought is Q. Q occurs to you, you think, oh, that's not right. Shouldn't be thinking about Q. All right, here we go. Don't think about Q. What is it I shouldn't think about? Q. Don't think about Q. Of course, every time you say don't think about Q, you're thinking about Q, aren't you? You haven't really pushed it out. So it's not so easy sometimes to push it out. So th this lumber merchant said, how do I push those thoughts out of my mind? And the Baal Shem said, don't push them out of your mind. Don't do that. But here's what you do. You're thinking about your lumber. Where's your lumber stored? In the warehouse. Uh-huh. And where was it before the warehouse? It was in the forest. Uh-huh. And where did the forest come from? Oh. In other words, use the foreign thought as the bottom rung on a ladder. Your job is to construct the higher rungs so you can climb back up. But you're using the foreign thought to climb back up. You're not pushing it out. You're using it positively. And that's a great element of Jewish spirituality. For that, you have to know a little, shall I say, metaphysics, where do things come from? It's a, it's a um, principle of the Torah, and the Hasidus stressed it, that everything in the world has a root, and the root above ultimately is something good. On the way down, or the way we use it once it gets into our world, could be distorted. But the root is always good. And if you, the first step is to trace it back to its root. So, any illicit love, that is to say love of power, or love of, of uh, pleasure, or love of a person who's illicit, or whatever, uh, trace itself back to the ultimate love, which is love of a Kodesh Baruch It's just that love misplaced, that love distorted, twisted in a certain way. Um, and tracing things back gives you, gives you that perspective. Here's a statement from the Chazanish, which I found to be very Hasidic, and I, I don't mean that tongue-in-cheek, I mean it really. Things split in the last hundred years. Yeshivas have split into different yeshivas. And Hasidic groups have split. Um, and on the surface, sometimes the split is contested and there are sides and there are recriminations and so forth and so on. So the, the Chazanish, I didn't see it inside. I was told by someone who knows the writings of the Chazanish. They said the following. Imagine a person <coughs> who's undertaken a project that requires great self-sacrifice. He's working at it 16 hours a day. He's pledged all his money to it. His time, concern, to become a top value. Somebody comes along and says, you're making a mistake. That project isn't worth it. He's undercutting your reason for living, that's all. 
because that's what you've dedicated yourself to altogether. <laughs> a contemporary philosopher named Derek Parfit, very, very influential philosopher, he worked on a certain project. And he says, if I'm wrong about this, then I will have wasted my life. I don't know, I thought that was a little grandiose. <laughs> okay. but, but that's the way that people feel about it. So now, in order to maintain the motivation to make those kinds of sacrifices, he has to believe he's right, capital R. Anybody who questions the rightness of what he's doing is undermining his whole life's project. So you say, okay, but you might be wrong, you know, and you should take it seriously, and you should, uh-huh, you should, that's right, definitely should, but you see where the stress is coming from. Stress is coming from something beautiful, that he's dedicated himself to something which he believes is the will of the creator of the universe, and he's willing to sacrifice everything for that. That's beautiful. He might be making some sort of mistake, but that doesn't deprive the project of its beauty. So the first thing you have to do, you know, instead of, I would say, in practical terms, you don't come to them and say, dope, people make mistakes. You also could make a mistake. Open your mind. Maybe you'll come out of it improved. Be objective about it. That's probably not going to get you anywhere. First thing you have to do is acknowledge what he's doing. Acknowledge what his, what his values are. Acknowledge the idealism in what he's doing. And then say, but in order to do it even better, Maybe you should check alternatives and see how, what ways you, what you're doing could be improved or something like that. That's tracing it back to, to, the, to the root and preserving the connection with the root and then just refocusing, retuning, as you would say for a radio connection, retuning the way in which that root expresses itself in the world. Um, I can tell you that from a certain point of view, because I represent a city point of view, um, we see a sort of asymmetry between us and other groups. There is a, they say, use a vitz, you know, this kind of nasty remark that the Messiah must be not a chassid. He has to be an anti chassid. He has to be a, a litvashim, you know, yeshivas, and so on and so on. Why? Why must he be an anti chassid? Because if he were a chassid, the rest of them wouldn't accept him. Implying, got the joke, that if he's not a chassid, we will accept him. But if he's one of us, they won't accept him. Um, but that's, that's the idea of being committed and dedicated and sacrificing for your project, and yet there being room in the world for alternatives, not having to go that extra step of saying, and only I am right and nobody else is right, and therefore, you know, everything else is wrong. But recognizing where it's coming from, 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 a, from a good root, that was basically the, with that minus the joke at the end, uh, it, was, it was the idea of the Chazanish. And I thought to myself, that is a, that is a Chazanish idea. Another idea from the Chazanish, which has a similar, if I say, a parallel, application, though it's not similar in content, um, there's a statement in the Talmud that when a person does an action, um, well, I'm sorry, he, he decides to do a mitzvah, and then he's prevented from doing the mitzvah by circumstances beyond his control. How could that be? You're standing on one side of the street, and across the street you see a person who's asking for charity. And the traffic's whizzing by. And you think, when I get over there, I'm going to give him charity. You know, yeah, you have money in your pocket. And the, the cars are going by, and the trucks are going by, the bus is going by, and finally the slide stops, and you cross the street. By the time you cross the street, the guy's gone. He's gone. So you decided to do the mitzvah, and you were stopped by the second days beyond your control. So the Gemara said, Literally, if you talk from the dictionary, it means the Kodesh Baruch Hu, attaches it to, connects it to, action. In context, it's taken to mean you get credit for the action also, even though you didn't do the action. If you look at the Gemara, sure, there's some, some types of credit you'll get. And the question is, why did the Gemara choose the word for connecting, where all it really means is that you're going to get credit? So the Chazari said, I'll tell you why. Because 
This guy had in mind to do a mitzvah and was prevented from doing the action. There are other people who do actions semi-automatically and have very little in mind. And Kush Baruch Hu connects this one's mind with this one's action and makes something perfect out of it. What a beautiful idea. You don't say, you were favored by heaven to be able to do the action, too bad for you. And you, mindlessly, you're doing it mindlessly, bah, what's, the, what's the worth of that? No, no. Each of you created something incomplete, and of course, Baruch Hu will take the two of which you, or the two of you and make something complete out of it. That's again, that, this is real, this is, and that's why I say we can claim him as a, as a chassid because these are chassidish ideas. Um, you know, the others will say that we just luckily happened to hit on something which happened to be right. <laughs> and he's coming from a more core way, which makes it right. Well, I'm happy with that, with that description also. I don't, mind. <laughs> I don't mind. So this now becomes the project. When you find in yourself some negative element, so I think usually the process is a two-step process. First would be doing tshuva out of yira to get control. When you are in the grips of a habit, which is, which is a bad habit, it's very difficult to simply take, take charge of it and manage it to use it and expressing it in an appropriate fashion. Because typically a person to a certain extent out of control, either he's a clinical addict or he's just lost a battle so often that he doesn't exercise the effort that he, that he could exercise. And the Yira will stop the action without correcting the psychology. Correcting psychology is a big progress, a big project. First, you want to gain control of the behavior, but then you can go on to look for um, the ways in which you can take that psychology and use it positively and achieve the integration that we identified with doing Shiva out of love. So I, I've given this year many times, and once here many years ago, someone asked me, what about being very aggressive? very uh, competitive and, uh, you know, having a temper and... So I said, gee, that's a good question. I'll go home and ask my wife. So I went home and asked my first wife and she said, become an advocate for victims. Oh, there are people who are suffering. And they're suffering because other people are taking advantage of them. And you can be aggressive and you can be argumentative and you can be, you know, tough, and so forth and so on, because you're protecting people or rectifying the wrongs that they've suffered. That's a way of taking it and using it positively. So this now applies to every, every uh, aspect of life which has demerits to find those contexts. And then the hope is that when you find the context in which this aspect of life finds expression, eventually the wildness or the focus on the inappropriate expression will decay, will go into, in, into extinction. Um, and then you'll be left with using it on, on the positive side. So for example, if you take pleasure, physical pleasure, um, I think I, was, I said this in the previous year, right? but I want to mention that physical pleasure is not the enemy. There are a lot of sources that physical pleasure is something that's, that's appropriate. Um, once a year in the spring, when fruit trees start to bloom in, in uh, uh, ER and Nissan, we go out and, and make a blessing on the trees, and we thank the Kodesh Baruch for creating these wonderful trees and other creatures. And one phrase in that blessing is lahanos ber to give pleasure to people. He created them to give pleasure to people. Well, then it can't be wrong to have pleasure from them. That's what he created them for. Uh, you make a bracha. Bari nefashos rabos v'chesvonon al kol mashu barasa la'achis min l'shkolchai bruch cheholamim. Teisus in in the sechta brachos explains that bracha. And he says, this is after the most ordinary foods <coughs> and drinks. <coughs> you created many souls and what they lack. 
That is to say, the things that they lack, things that they need. Says Tysus, what is it that the soul needs? Bread and water. That's what you need. You can live on bread and water. That's all you need. I'll call Masha Barasa, goes on, for everything that you've created. What's that for, says Tysus? The Tanug Ba'alma, just for pleasure. Everything else that you eat and drink was made just for pleasure. And he gives an example. Kagon tapuchim, like apples. Apples are there just for your pleasure. That's what the Baruch is talking about. Well, if they were made for your pleasure, then it can't be wrong to have pleasure in them. Now, that's as far as Tysus goes. I want to finish the thought. Well, in this case, I'm positive that Tysus had it in mind. How does the blessing go on? Akomashi Barosa, Lahachayos, Bahem nefesh kol chai, to give life to all living souls. Then the bracha is saying that physical pleasure gives life to living souls. And without physical pleasure, there won't be life for living souls. So pleasure is not just something that was permissible, grudgingly, in, my, in the most minute amounts that you're capable. No, it has a positive contribution to make to the person. And as I said in the last hour, the first chapter of the Masil Sushorim says that physical pleasure is a necessary part of the life of a person who serves the Kodesh Baruch Hu because physical pleasure enables a person to have um, Yishuv Hadas and Nachas Ruach. Yishuv Hadas means a directed mentality. And it comes from being So I can think of the right word. Yishuv means undisturbed, unagitated, unirritated, and therefore open to be focused. And nachas uh, means a certain amount of pleasure and satisfaction. A base, base level of your experience that's fine. How are things? Fine. Now why is that important, to have those two uh, psychological qualities? Because only then can you empty your heart and then fill it with service of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Because if you can't focus or your life is derailed, if you're constantly worried and upset and feeling victimized and so forth and so on, then those things fill your heart and they don't leave room to empty your heart and of everything else and serve a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So the physical pleasure leads to those two mental qualities which leads to the appropriate service of Kodesh Baruch Hu, and therefore the physical pleasure is necessary. I mean, it even goes further than that. I'm just realizing now. Someone might say, okay, physical pleasure does that, but there might be other things to do with it as well. Who says it's the only thing that does it? The Mr. Shishorim says it's the only thing that does it. Nothing else can be trusted to do it. So that means that it's a necessary part of your life. So having heard that, the attitude towards physical pleasure can't be, not for me, I'm going to deaden my, my, my nerve endings. My sensory nerves are going to go blank. I won't taste the food. I won't you know, taste the drink. I won't enjoy the, the, the songs and so forth and so on. No, that's not right. That's not right. Capacity for pleasure is a necessary part. As I said this afternoon, we were studying in the Rambam, the Shemona Prakim, there's a whole chapter, the sixth chapter, where he talks about the necessity for it and serving a Kodesh Baruch in very direct ways. In the fourth chapter now, we'll get there in this session. So, uh, but then how do you deal with pleasure? So the way, the way you deal with pleasure is you use pleasure to enhance a mitzvah. There are mitzvahs which are enhanced by experiencing pleasure when you do the mitzvah. And this happens in a variety of ways. First of all, we spoke then about onik, onik Shabbos, onik Yom Tov. Onik means enjoying, having pleasure in the meals, the songs, the, which mean a state of enjoyment on Shabbos and on holidays. <clears throat> so the enjoyment there is part of your celebration of the holiday. After all, suppose there's somebody, the king, the king comes to pay you a visit. Great honor. Great distinction. Does he want you to enjoy it or not? I think part of your appreciation of him is that you enjoy it. Wow. 
It was great. The king came to me. That's part of you appreciating how great he is. Tell it over with a smile and says, you know, that was six years ago, I can't forget it. It was, so, it was so wonderful that the king came. So the pleasure there is a positive part of the, uh, of the experience. Uh, there is a Bartanura. It's one of these cases where the Bartanura says two things. Everybody knows one and almost no one knows the other. The Mishnah Perki Avos says, Schar mitzvah mitzvah. Literally, the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Three words in Hebrew. But as Mahatma Noam Chomsky would say, it's syntactically ambiguous. You can read it in two different ways. One way to read it is like this. Uh, the reward of a mitzvah, you don't know what a reward of a mitzvah is. You may have some ideas, but you don't know. I have to tell you. It's quite surprising. The reward of a mitzvah is... Trumpets, the opportunity to do another mitzvah. Ha, didn't know that, did you? That's the surprise. You now know what the reward of a mitzvah is, is to do another mitzvah. That's one way to read it. That's the way that Barton explains it. Everybody knows that. But there's another way to explain it. The way to explain it is like this. There's something called the reward of a mitzvah. You have no... You, you know what it is. Everybody knows what it is. The reward of a mitzvah is the pleasure that you have in doing the mitzvah. The pleasure, the enjoyment that you have in doing the mitzvah. That's the reward of the mitzvah. But you don't know something. You don't know that the pleasure that you have in doing the mitzvah is also mitzvah. It's more mitzvah. It gives you more credit for the mitzvah. You don't know that. Not only don't you know it, but it sounds absolutely nuts. Right? Schar mitzvah. Mitzvah. The schar mitzvah is the reward of doing it as a the pleasure and happiness and enjoyment you get out of doing the mitzvah. And the mitzvah is telling you you're surprised, that also counts as mitzvah. Hmm. You're like, wow, how does that work? Let's see, I'm blowing shofar, I'm blowing shofar for the, for the congregation on Rosh Hashanah, and they're satisfying their mitzvah with what I do. Now, is it better or worse that I should be paid? Oh, look at the Bartanura. If you get a reward for doing the mitzvah, it's more mitzvah. So it's better to be paid than it is not to be paid. Wrong conclusion. That's the wrong conclusion. Okay, so something's going wrong. I have to figure out what this could possibly mean, that the reward of the mitzvah, uh, which is the pleasure and the enjoyment and everything else, is mitzvah. I've asked this question of Tamil Chachamim, and um, no one showed me a source with which they could explain it. I've thought of an explanation, I try it out on them, and they're at least not inclined to push it off immediately. I haven't heard back that they have a better explanation. Let's go back to, to love. Let's go to, let's go to contrast now between love and duty. Love and duty. There are two sons, a father, a father who brought the sons up and invested in them and loved them and provided for them. He's now elderly and he needs help. And the two sons are there. They're ready to help. And when he calls at 2.30 in the morning and it's leading outside, so they both come running. And they come with smiles on their faces. And they do whatever needs to be done with great uh, attention great completeness, but the fundamental motivation of the two of them is different. One is acting out of duty. Father calls, he looks at the phone at 2.30 in the morning. <gasps> it's dad again. Hello, dad. How can I help you? Because he knows what he needs to do. He needs to do it eagerly. He needs to do it with a smile. And he does it eagerly and with a smile because that's his duty. His duty is that's how he should serve his father. The other son loves his father. Sees the phone. It's dad. I can do something for him. What a wonderful opportunity. Because I love him and I want to do for him. Hello, dad. What can I do for you? Now, when the father hears the voice on the, uh, on the other end of the line, he can't tell the difference between them. But in the life, in the hearts, you've got two different things going on. Okay, you understand the image that I'm giving you? Now, ask me, answer me this question. Which one has more pleasure, more happiness, and more joy in doing the service of the Father? Second. The second one, obviously, isn't it? The first one is irritated. He's irritated, but he chokes it down and does it with a smile. The second one's not irritated. He's thrilled to have the chance to do it. Okay. Now, 
Take into the mix the following statement from the Talmud, the Fumtsara Agra. The more resistance there is to do the mitzvah, the greater your reward. Are we really going to say that the son who does it out of duty gets more reward because he has more resistance to overcome in serving the Father? The answer is no, for sure, because serving God out of love is superior to serving God out of fear and awe and duty. So what happens to the statement in the Talmud that the more the resistance, the more irritation, the more pain it costs to do the mitzvah, the, the, the more the reward. It's not talking about this kind of pain versus this kind of pleasure. Not talking about that. It's talking about two people who are irritated. One's irritated a little and the other's irritated a lot. I go hiking in the sleet. You know, it doesn't bother me so much. I'd rather sleep, of course, no question. But I go for a hike in the sleep, you know. Sometimes I do it voluntarily. It's not, it's not a fail. It's not a big deal. The other guy says, oh, oh, get out of bed, get out of the cold and the wet and everything else, right? He has more resistance, so he has more reward. But not when it's competing with serving out of love. Where there's joy and happiness in doing it, you don't lose any credit for that. That's what the Bartender is talking about. So here, the service out of love means there'll be more pleasure. There'll be more pleasure in doing it. And it becomes an enhancement of the mitzvah. Not a detraction from the mitzvah. And indeed, the picture that some people have that a tzaddik must be morose with, with <laughs> oh, another mitzvah to do. Oh, God. Can I, can I stand this? I can't. Oh, it's so hard. I'm coming. I'm coming because I have to. And I'm doing what I have to. Boy, I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> okay. A little bit of a burlesque. <laughs> um, that's not, that's, that's not correct. That's not correct. Here, the love expresses itself in happiness, and the tzaddik can spend his whole life happy. Happy. Joyous. If there's Hashem B'Simcha, and serving at Kodesh Baruch Hu is 24-7, 365, even when you're sleeping, says the Rambam, in addition to the Ma'aram Chal, in those days. So, that being the case, happiness is a positive part of your spirituality. So the idea is to look for ways to gerrymander the experience of pleasure and happiness into cases where it's positive, in which case you're loving a good world with that side of your character as well. And then the hope is that eventually the demand of this side of your character for illicit expression will, as the as the psychologists say, go into extinction. Yeah. Is it possible that in that Talmud teaching, because I agree with your rabbi, I agree with your rabbi that, that there's more reward for a mitzvah when it's resistant. It's not referring to inner resistance. It's talking about the circumstances that surround doing the mitzvah. And so you can be just as joyous. No, no, yeah. no, no. The word in the Hebrew, is, uh, the word in the Gemara is tzara. Tzara means suffering. Oh. So, tzara means suffering. So, so, you have to overcome the inner negative motivation because it costs you. And so that's where there is more. So it actually is saying that that's where there's more reward. That's right. Okay. That's right. So it's a subtle, it's a subtle. You can ask people this question. I think I think it's a terrific question. What is that bartender going to do with the Fum Tzara? And what does he mean when he says Onigan and Hano for for doing the mitzvah and you get more you get more mitzvah credit when you, when you did it with uh, Onigan? I, I think it's uh, you know something that needs an authoritative uh, I told you I spoke to Tamil Khachamim, they tend to agree with me. I didn't get anything more than that, yeah. Because the way I was understanding uh, was understanding it is that say it's sunny outside and you need to walk to shul. It's wonderful that you can be joyous while you go walk to shul in the sun. And say now it's raining and you might say, I don't really want to go to shul, but then you also have the perspective that now I get to have, elevate my service because now it's, there's more of a there's, a, there's a factor in the environment that may prevent me from doing the mitzvah otherwise, but I can now do the mitzvah with this you know, challenge ahead of, you know, in front of me. And so you still keep your, your joyous disposition while doing the mitzvah, but now the variables surrounding it make it such that it's more elevated because you keep the same joyous disposition even though ordinarily it may not be as easy to do so. You're right, you're right, but I'm talking about a higher level than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I understand? That, if you love someone and the person you love asks you for something, it, it's a joy to do it. And in a certain sense, the harder the thing is to do, 
the more joy it begin, brings because you show how, how deep your love is. You show how much you care. And this, this is giving you an opportunity to show how much you care. Also, there's the fact that the other person asking to you means the other person trusts you. The other person trusts you that you care enough to want to do this even though it's hard. And the exact same thing is true when the Kodesh Baruch Hu sends to Nisoyim, talks to another, or sends a, or he gives a mitzvah, is an opportunity. So you think, okay, this is a hard mitzvah. It's a precious opportunity to show Kodesh Baruch Hu how much I care. And because you're showing how much you care, you do it with great joy. So it's, it's a very high level. And, that, and the ple- it wouldn't be that level if you didn't have that pleasure in it. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is, again, the, the project of finding ways to... I'll give you one, one more example of this, which I, I think is also exquisite. Um, the, the, Mishnah, the famous Mishnah says that you make a blessing of something good and a blessing of something bad, two different blessings, and it says, just like you make the blessing of something good, so you make the blessing of something bad. Those are different blessings. So, in what way is it just like? So the explanation is that when something bad happens, you make the blessing with joy, just like you make the blessing when you uh, make the blessing of something good. So, the tour in the Shulchan Aruch, Explain this in a certain way, the same way, it's based on a Bach, and here's the explanation. Number one, when something good happens and you make the blessing of something good, what you are joyous about is the good thing that happened. When something bad happens and you make the blessing of something bad, you are not joyous about the thing that happened. Absolutely not. Indeed, the Bach says it's impossible not to feel pain when one of these things happens. So then, what is the joy about? The joy about it is this, says the Torah and the Shulchan Aruch, that because you're in pain, you have an opportunity to accept the pain out of love of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, who knows that it's what you need, what's good for you. And accepting the pain out of love is a great service of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, And that's what you rejoice in. Rejoice in the opportunity to perform this great service of a Kodesh Baruch. So there, it's this, then I talked about masochism. There, it's the very fact that you're acting out of pain which creates the simcha. Simcha! As the Torah says, you make the blessing with simcha. The simcha is on that opportunity. So this is, this Part of what, I, what you should see from these examples is the variety and the sophisticated analysis of these kinds of situations that the Torah provides. You know, when you talk about psychology, the first place you ought to look is in the Torah sources. That's where the real psychology comes from. I was so in Boston, all of us always used to tell us the statements in the Gemara about psychology aren't observation of human nature. They're a masora. They're part of the tradition that goes back to prophecy. And they're just as binding as tefillin and, and tzitzis and, and mezuzah and they are how people, human beings work. And if you don't see it, it's because you're not looking right or because they're hiding it from you. Um, and we pask on the basis of these, of these principles of psychology, we pask certain halachas. So here we're being told something very, very important about the nature of pleasure and the nature of... Um, how you use the facilities that are in your, that are in your, uh, in your repertoire to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Now, whether every element of the, of the personality can be used positively or whether some have to just be switched off as much as possible is a matter of great discussion. Um, the analogy here in straight halacha would be that there are some things which can be elevated and used in Sir Kodesh Baruch Hu's service and there are some things which can't. A Jew, an idol that was worshipped by a Jew has to be destroyed, period. You can't give it to charity, you can't use it to build a temple, temple with, or a, a synagogue with, it has to be destroyed. But then the mitzvah that you're doing is destroying it. Just that there's not, no way to positively use it. Now, Rav Dessler says that when we talk about the Yetzirah Hara, there are out and out contradictions, both in the description of the Yetzirah Hara and its ultimate, um, what happens to the Yetzirah ultimately. And he says there are two types of Yetzirah. 
One is the internal character of the body, which is morally and spiritually blind, wants what it wants when it wants it, irrespective of whether it's good or bad, spiritual or not, and therefore leads people to do many bad things. And then there's another um, type of Yetzirah, which he calls a malach, like an angel, who's thoroughly evil. Wants evil because it's evil. And there, you have to turn your back. That, yeah, you have to turn back. You can't elevate the body because it's morally and spiritually blind and neutral. It can be elevated. You can sublimate it. But the, 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 the famous verse that, that characterizes the angel is, mind gluvi miyum taku. Stolen waters are sweet. They're sweet because they're stolen. So, ha, it's on there. It's got his name on it. Aha, uh-huh. so I'm going to take it. Then you find out that some joker put his name on it. It doesn't belong to him anyhow. And it was Hefker. It was perfectly per- permissible to take. Oh, no, forget it. Forget it. No, no. I want his. I don't want to just, be, just have the pleasure of the thing. There, because it's dedicatedly anti-Torah, anti-Tov, anti-God, there you can't, you can't elevate it anymore. There you have to, you have to push it away. And uh, the sources that talk about the ultimate end talk about the body becoming sublimated and integrated and elevated and spiritualized and sanctified and all the rest. And there's a Zohar that says that the Satan, which is the, that type of Yetzahara, Kodroch will use Arba Misos Bezdin, the four types of, of juridical execution on the Satan, to destroy the Satan. It's a Zohar and Parsha Shoftim. So there are two, and they get two different outcomes. So it could be and all I'm talking about now is the body with its moral and spiritual blindness, which can be elevated. And there's another source of evil that a person has to contend with, which can't be elevated in that way. But then it's Shnei Yitzarecha, your two inclinations. This will be, in Rav Tesla's terms, the two internal inclinations, as, as opposed to the external. And that's why one's internal was external. Internal means it's part of you. And then the love, as I described it, wants all of you to be involved in the love. Right? Amalek is not part of you. It's external to you. So that could be rejected. Anyway, that's a little, little connection to some sources. All right.